The Game of Life was invented by Milton Bradley in 1860. An educator and religious man, Bradley created the iconic spinner because he associated dice with gambling. The original version was called the checkered game of life due to the game's checkerboard setup and life's checkered path of rewards and risks, such as wealth, poverty, happiness, or misfortune. There was even a space for duel, which evidently still occurred in 1860. The game of life underwent a dramatic revamp in 1960 for its 100th anniversary. Though the spinner remained, the updated version looks little like the original, which was focused on the pursuit of virtue. The revamp reflected 1960s optimism. Players spin to win and move their game pieces, brightly colored automobiles, around the game board, encountering life events along the road. Get a job, get married, have children, and retire at millionaire acres. You know, pursue the American dream. The game of life features a shocking lack of freedom. Reflecting the conformity of the day, only a few places on the board offer a fork where players choose the road they want. For example, players can choose the family path, which results in one or more children, or a childless life path. Whereas the original version left matrimony to chance, the 1960 version made matrimony mandatory. Players make a perfunctory stop at a designated spot and add either a pink or blue spouse peg to the passenger seat of their car. I recall there was something strangely satisfying about the act, as though I had accomplished something special. Mandatory marriage was not a far-out concept in 1960, when 90% of American adults were either married or would eventually marry. The average age of first marriage was just 21. Few accomplishments come close to those proportions. The turnout for the Kennedy-Nixon election was 62%, church attendance was 63%, and the high school graduation rate was 59%. Since then, graduation rates have gone up, church attendance has gone down, and voter turnout remains roughly the same. Marriage rates have since gone down, way down. Yet society today still feels like 1960 in a lot of ways, built for two. To understand how the world came to be built for two, and a particular type of two, we need to go back a few million years to meet Lucy and learn what makes humans unique in the animal kingdom. Unearthed by paleoanthropologists in the Afar region of Ethiopia in 1974, Lucy is a remarkably well-preserved fossil of a female Australopithecus afarensis, hominin, which roamed the Earth on two legs between 3.9 and 2.9 million years ago. Lucy's discovery was an important moment in understanding what makes humans unique. Like her human descendants, who have been around for 2.9 million years, and early Homo sapiens, us, who've been around for 200,000 years, she lived the hunter-gatherer life. Lucy might have pair-bonded, the creation of strong emotional attachments between individuals, and she may have had children. However, if she wanted to walk down the aisle, she would have to wait about 3 million years, till 2350 BCE, when the first documented marriage between a man and a woman occurred in Mesopotamia. For those of you who don't want to look at a map, Mesopotamia is where Iraq, Kuwait, Turkey, and Syria are now located. For those of you who don't want to do the math, that was just 4,377 years ago. To put this all into perspective, matrimony, which is so pervasive and such an important milestone in a human's development, has only been around for a small part of history. Prior to its invention, single was the natural state of the world. Well before inventing domestic bliss, humans managed to establish themselves as the undisputed apex predators on a global scale. How did they achieve this extraordinary dominance? Not by brute strength or exceptional speed or the ability to throw a spear. Rather, from an exceptional ability to cooperate and create culture. 